in our Tuesday night Bible study, we've been studying the book of Zechariah. And this past week, we read Zechariah 5 through 8. And I want to go ahead and read it again, because Zechariah is talking about a time is, is talking about the very time that we're living in. Zechariah 4 spoke of the witnesses and also the fact that Zerubbabel, representing Christ, laid the foundation of this temple and he's going to complete it. And it talks about this thing that Jesus is doing during this period, this final seven, as spoken of in Daniel 9, this final seven in which the holy place is going to be anointed. Jesus is completing his temple and Zechariah 4 says that people are going to rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hands of Zerubbabel. Now, the capstone on a building is locks all of the pieces, all of the stones into place. We've been described as living stones. And so this is what's happening is that he is finalizing this temple. And there's something there. There are some very specific and important things that happen during this last seven, this last week this last seven-year period before the resurrection, of which we are living through right now, guys. So this is what he's been talking about. And we actually started out our book study with, with the book of Revelation. And we continue every Wednesday to have a study of the book of Revelation because it is such an important book. And it's the one book that counterfeit pastors don't think that they need to study, not that they ever correctly study any other part of the Bible, but they don't think that they need to know about it because it doesn't apply to them. And, and uh, you know, it partly doesn't apply to them because they think that a group of Jews in the Middle East are going to bear all of this for them. So why does it matter? They're going to be raptured. And if it's not stupid rapture theory that they believe in, it's, uh, you know, they're just going to be on the sidelines or something. I mean, I don't even know what they think is going to happen while other people are bearing this for them. But actually, it turns out we're li living during this time, and the book of Revelation is extremely important, and it sums up so much of what the prophets have said about this time, of what is written in the book of Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Zechariah. Very, very important. And today we did, yesterday and today we've been doing this study of the book of Daniel uh, chapter 9 regarding the 77s. And so we talked about what is, you know, the first seven and the 62 sevens. That represents the time that Cyrus made the decree to rebuild the temple and rebuild Jerusalem up until the time that Jesus was crucified. That's the first seven sevens and 62 sevens. But then there's this one seven or one week that's separated out for the time of the very end. And so we understand that this is being fulfilled all the way to the end when the most holy place is being anointed. The most holy place in the temple is the bride of Christ. Those who will be sons of God, who will receive an inheritance, who go up in the first resurrection, who are most holy and will reign with Christ for a thousand years. So let's read Zechariah 5. I looked again, and there before me was a flying scroll. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll, 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. And he said to me, this is the curse that's going out over the whole land. For according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished. And according to what it says on the other, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. Okay, you remember that Jesus talks about the thieves? Who was he talking to, by the way? When he was saying that, he was talking to Pharisees. And he said that the thief is, is anyone who comes in any other way but through the gate. They're a thief. They're trying to steal his flock. Every thief will be banished. And according to what it says on the other, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. So there are some among that flock who swear falsely. And as a matter of fact, there are quite a few. They swear falsely in his name. The Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out and it will enter the house, you're a house, the house of the thief and the house of anyone who swears falsely by my name. So he's sending out a curse. It will remain in that house and destroy it completely, both its timbers and its stones. Well, we should understand this language very well if we understand the Old Testament and we take it seriously. Let's go to Levit Leviticus 14, 
Verse 33, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when you enter the land of Canaan, which I'm giving you as your possession, and I put a spreading mold in that house, in a house in that land, the owner of the house must go and tell the priest, I've seen something that looks like a defiling mold in my house. The priest is to order the house to be empty before he goes in to examine the mold so that nothing in the house will be pronounced unclean. After this, the priest is to go in and inspect the house. He is to examine the mold on the walls, and if it has greenish or reddish depressions and appear to be deeper than the surface of the wall, the priest should go, shall go out the doorway of the house and close it up for seven days. So we kind of understand that. That's something similar to what doctors do, right? They examine something, usually not very well, but they examine it and they look at, okay, these are the symptoms, and then they make a diagnosis. But the priest doesn't do that. He just examines it for a different reason. I want you to recognize that because what's going on with doctors is not what God established. God has not told you to live by a bunch of diagnoses, guys. So stop saying that you have autism and ADHD and all of these things that the world talks about. It's something else. There is something else going on. All he does is take note of what the symptoms are. And the reason he's doing it, I'm going to tell you right now, the reason why he's doing it is because when he goes back, he needs something, a, a basis by which to say, okay, it's gotten better or it's not. The same thing with the story just before this regarding the defiling skin disease. So he's closed up the house for seven days, and on the seventh day, the priest shall return to inspect the house. If the mold is spread on the walls, he is to order that the contaminated stones be torn out and thrown into an unclean place outside the town. So you hear what he's saying? If the mold has spread, if it hasn't gotten better, after being isolated, what do you do in isolation, guys? Those of you who fast regularly, I hope some of you do. If, when you are isolating or when God says, go, my people, enter your house, cl houses, close the door for a little while until my wrath has subsided. During Passover, what were they supposed to be doing? Ridding their houses of yeast. They're isolating from the rest of the world. They are ridding their houses of yeast. They are separating themselves from the world consecrating themselves to God, cutting off the tentacles of the flesh, so circumcising from the sinful flesh and disciplining their physical flesh. That's what you're doing in isolation. That's what you should be doing when you're fasting. And so if you come out of a fast and you still got mold or you're still connected to the sinful flesh, you, you haven't succeeded at doing what God has commanded you to do when you go into isolation. You've not returned to him. And the evidence is there because the mold has gotten worse. Pharisees, you hypocrites, clean the inside of the bowl and then the outside will be clean, right? So to go and speak from a pulpit when the inside is full of mold and unclean things. And the evidence is there because God, God foils those who are swearing falsely in his name. The evidence is there that your house is not clean. If you are not getting better... The evidence is there that your house is not being cleaned, that you have not returned to him. And he gives us lots of opportunities. And so when we look at Zechariah, we know the time period of which Zechariah is speaking is during the first three and a half years of that seven year period. When the trumpets, the trumpets one through four are blowing, when the witnesses are here, they're trying to get you to clean up. God's calling you in with this judgment. And if nothing's changing, eventually you're going to be spit out. Eventually that curse is going to go into your body and tear down both your timbers and your stones. It's going to go into your house and destroy it. So it says, if the mold is spread on the walls, he is to order that the contaminated stones be torn out and thrown into an unclean place outside the town. They're gone. You understand? The stones in that house, if they're trying to defile God's house, they're going to be thrown out and they will be cast outside of the camp. He must have all the inside of the walls scraped and the material that is scraped off dumped into an unclean place outside the town. Then they are to take the other stones to replace these and take new clay and plaster the house. If the defiling mold reappears in the house after the stones have been torn out and the house scraped and plastered, the priest is to go and examine it and if the mold is spread in the house, it is a persistent, defiling mold. The house is unclean. It must be torn down. It's, to it's stones, timbers, and all the plaster and taken out of the town to an unclean place. 
That should be a very clear message. So he is combining two concepts that he used in the Old Testament that he established with the Israelites to help them to understand what it means to be cleansed, to be a clean house. And then in the New Testament, he talks about you as a house, doesn't he? So there's Leviticus 14. Now we're going to go to Numbers 5. So he's talking about this curse that's going to be sent out to anyone who swears falsely in his name and anyone who is a thief and it's going to enter the house and it's going to uh, destroy it, both its timbers and its stones. Now we're going to read about the curse of bitter water. Numbers 5.11. Then the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him so that another man has sexual relations with her and this is hidden from her husband and her impurity is undetected. Since there is no witness against her and she's not been caught in the act, and if feelings of jealousy come over her husband and he suspects his wife and she is impure, or if he is jealous and suspects her, even though she is not impure, then he is to take his wife to the priest. He must also take an offering of a tenth of an ephah, barley, flour, on her behalf. He must not pour olive oil on it or put incense on it because it is a grain offering for jealousy, a reminder offering to draw attention to wrongdoing. The priest shall bring her and have her stand before the Lord. Then he shall take some holy, holy water. That is not the right translation. I'm going to tell you right now because there is no precedent for holy water. I already did a video on this. This is, then he shall take the water set aside. The same word is used that, that for something that's been set aside for a purpose. There is no precedent for holy water, so don't take this. This is the lying pen of the scribes handling it falsely. The lying pen of the, of the translators. The Bible's not wrong. The translators are. So he is to take the water that's been set apart for this purpose in a clay jar and put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. By the way, if this was holy water, would you be taking dirt from the floor and putting it in holy water? That doesn't make sense, does it? If you can see that, you have more sense than anyone who's translated. After the priest has had the woman stand before the Lord, she, he shall loosen her hair and place in her hands the reminder offering, the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings a curse. Then the priest shall put the woman under oath and say to her, if no other man has had sexual relations with you and you have not gone astray and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations with another man, with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell, may this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Okay, does God hate women? Is that, is that what he's, he's trying to make an example of women because he just, he made them and he's just like, ugh, you disgust me. No, he likens his bride, his church to a woman. He likens her to a virtuous, a virtuous woman. What God hates is adultery, immorality, prostitution. That's what he hates. And he's making an example here. He uses a woman to describe his church. And he uses women to describe other churches. Men are not exempt from what God is establishing here. Because if you want to be the bride of Christ, you can't have it both ways. Then you have to acknowledge that what God is establishing is regarding his bride and helping us to understand what he hates and what we ought not do, and that we need to maintain fidelity to him. He just so happens to be representing this through a woman. Okay, so you heard the curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people. So if you've done this, may the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Are you hearing the theme of this is going to enter your house and it's going to tear down your timbers and... It's stones to all those who what? Swear falsely in his name. So they're prostitutes. They're adulterers. This is the curse of bitter water. God talks about it in a different way in Revelation uh, 8 when he's talking about wormwood. He's describing also that curse of bitter water. So if you don't, if you don't have a good foundation in the Old Testament, you're not going to be able to understand the new. There's, different, there's subtle differences in the language that God uses in different books, not because he's trying to be confusing, although I do believe that he presents a stumbling block to those who, you know, just read with their carnality and don't read with their heart and try to really rend their heart to understanding this. 
But the re one of the reasons why God does this, why he uses different symbolism, is because he is building our understanding of a concept that is, in his understanding is much bigger. Like he understands all of the layers and complexities and nuances of this concept. But we don't. We don't. So, I mean, he can say, okay, you've been a prostitute, you've been an adulterer. But when he starts to lay this out, like what the punishment is and what that looked like and how he feels about it and how other nations are looking at us and they're shocked at our lewd conduct. The very people who were set apart to be holy to God, other nations are shocked at the way that we behave. And, and let me tell you something right now. Other nations are shocked at the way counterfeit, counterfeit Christianity hands over approval for genocide. They're shocked at it. Because they know that God says don't murder. They know that God says don't steal. God's people don't know. Or is it that they don't care? Is it that they don't actually believe in him? Because how can you have fear for God? How can you have fear of God and blatantly desecrate his law in such an egregious way? So he has to use a lot of different concepts to get us to understand. He's talked about the nature of defilement in Leviticus 14 with regard to the house. Now he's talking about a curse that's going to be given to those who are unfaithful, those who are swearing falsely in his name. And you see a description here of a woman who is being told, if you have done these things, this is what's going to happen to you. You, accept, you are going to accept this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. That's entering your house and destroying it. Then the woman is to say, amen, so be it. So she's accepting it. The priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash them off into the bitter water. He shall make the woman drink bitter water that brings a curse and this water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering will enter her. Now, let me ask you something. Is the priest cursing her? Is, is, does the priest have power to curse her? No. The curse comes from God. She's accepting the curse. The priest is being used in order to demonstrate to her, these are the things that are going to happen to you, but the priest is not putting a curse on her. No human being has ever put a curse on anybody. God alone brings the curse. So don't misunderstand this. The priest is not doing some voodoo witchcraft, nor does he have the power to bring a curse. What's, what has the power to bring the curse? First of all, God does, but she has just permitted this curse if in fact she has been unfaithful. So don't go around saying that your mother-in-law is evil and she practices santeria and whatever it is that she practices and she's put a curse on you. Don't go around saying that. That is so stupid. And I hear people say that all the time. They contact me and tell me stories like that. If there is a curse on you, it's because of your sin. What is the reason why she would be experiencing a curse? Her own sin. Her own infidelity. He shall make the woman drink the bitter water that brings the curse. And this water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering will enter her. The priest is to take from her hands the grain offering for jealousy, wave it before the Lord, and bring it to the altar. The priest is then to take a handful of the grain offering as a memorial offering and burn it on the altar. After that, he is to have the woman drink the water. If she has made herself impure and been unfaithful to her husband, this will be the result. When she is made to drink the water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering, it will enter her, her abdomen will swell, and her womb will miscarry, and she will become a curse. If, however, the woman has not made herself impure but is clean, she will be cleared of guilt and will be able to have children. So I don't know, guys, should you be going to um, fertility experts to uh, make you have children or do you think you should return to God? Or was that only done in biblical times? Oh, never mind, never mind. Is he the same God or not? Is he capable of giving you children when you've returned to him? This then is the law of jealousy when a woman goes astray and makes herself impure while married to her husband or when feelings of jealousy come over a man because he suspects his wife. The priest is to have her stand before the Lord. That's what she's doing. She's standing before the Lord and is to apply this entire law to her. The, the husband will be innocent of any wrongdoing, but the woman will bear the consequences of her sin. Don't rely on your own understanding. Don't get upset and think that God hates women because men are held to the same standard. If a man 
is prostituting himself to the world and to the flesh, and he is not being faithful to God, and he's not living out his requirements in the covenant, he's got the same thing coming to him. And this isn't any different. God is just establishing something for you to understand. Let's read what Zechariah 5 says again. I looked again, and there before me was a flying scroll. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll, 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. And he said to me, this is the curse that's going out over the whole land. Now, was there, did the priest write down these things on a scroll? Yes, he did, as a matter of fact. And he said to me, this is the curse that's going out over the whole land, for according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished, and according to what it says on another, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. The Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out, and it will enter the house of the thief, and anyone who swears falsely by my name. It will remain in that house and destroy it completely, both its timbers and its stones. Hopefully that demystified it for you, because you should have that understanding in your pocket as you're reading that portion of Zechariah. Now, one of the things that I spoke about in the Bible study last Tuesday is these headings are a mixed bag. I, I actually prefer that the headings would not be there. And I'll tell you why. Because the Bible wasn't written with headings. And so I have found at times for the headings to be, that the headings are wrong. And at other times, I've found that the headings are misleading and that they, um, they sort of compartmentalize scripture as though that's how it was written. And so you see this heading, the flying scroll, and then you see this heading, the woman in the basket. So you're like compartmentalizing. Oh, let me understand the scroll and let me understand the woman in the basket. But I want you to read scripture as it's continuous. God started a thought and he's continuing the thought. It doesn't change because a new chapter or a new verse or a new heading started. So in, ver in chapter four, we talked about the witnesses and the completing of God's temple. What is God doing right now at this time in history? Then he talks about this curse that's going out to everyone who swears falsely in his name. They're not, these, these are not mutually exclusive events. God is separating the wheat from the tares right now. Right now, not, not, not the latter half of the seven year period. Right now. Because in Revelation 9, when the fifth trumpet blows and the, the Antichrist rises from the abyss, overpowers and kills the witnesses and then goes after God's people, it's already been decided. And Revelation 9 says that there is something that tortures everyone who does not have the seal of God. There, that is the first time it uses that language. Even though we know that the seal of God actually gets put on before the trump, all of the trumpets blow, it uses, the word uses different language in, in Revelation 9 when talking about the fifth trumpet. And the reason why is because no one repents after the fifth trumpet. No one returns to God. Something has been decided and established because God has been separating the wheat from the tares. So, well, why, why are you still here then during that last, seven, that last uh, portion of the seven years, the last three and a half years plus 45 days? The reason you're still here is outlined in Revelation 3 when he's talking to the church in Philadelphia and he says to this second lampstand, the witnesses, I'm going to spare you from the hour of trial that I'm going to bring on the inhabitants of the earth to test them. What you're doing is living out your covenant and being tested. And the reason why is stated in Ezekiel, God tried to cleanse you, but you would not be cleaned. That's a lot of you on this channel, I'll tell you right now. I speak to you, I tell you these things, you know, you, you're you here, so you must be think that you're hearing something true. But do you apply it? Do you put it into practice? Because God addresses that as well. He says to Ezekiel that his people come to him and say, let's, let's hear what he has to say today. But they treat him as one who sings a song and plays an instrument well but they don't put anything that he says into practice. He also addresses the issue of not listening. He says, I'm sending you to a people, not of obscure, peop uh, of obscure language and strange speech, but the people of Israel. And you are to say what I tell you to say to them, whether they listen or they fail to listen. And they're not gonna listen because they don't listen to me. They will not listen to you because they do not listen to me. And then Ezekiel goes in the anger and bitterness of his spirit. Why do you think? Because it stinks to do this every single day when people don't listen. If you're really listening, you will put this into practice. 
If you're really listening, you will assemble with God's people. If you're really listening, you will go back to God and you will discern if the things that I'm saying are true. And if they're true, then you need to inquire about what to do in order to join God's people for Sabbath assembly because you are commanded to do that. You need to inquire about how to join God's people and observe new moon and the holy days because there's no time to live this life for you. So this is not separate. I want you to understand this is a continuous stream of thought in scripture. Then the angel who was speaking to me came forward and said to me, look up and see what is appearing. I asked, what is it? Okay, so what has he just gotten done talking about? He's talking about a curse that's going to those who swear falsely in his name. Now he's saying, there's, an, there's something appearing. I asked, what is it? He replied, it's a basket. And he added, this is the iniquity of the people throughout the land. Then the cover of lead was raised, and there in the basket sat a woman. What's a woman, guys? It's a church. This is not a good church here. He's already identified her to be the iniquity of the people throughout the land. He said, this is wickedness. And he pushed her back into the basket and pushed its lead cover down on it. In Revelation 17, 5, he refers to this woman as Babylon the Great, the mother of all prostitutes. So she has prostitute daughters that bore out of her and she and of the abominations of the earth, the mother of all prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Here, you have the language of, he replied, it's a basket. And he added, this is the iniquity of the people throughout the land and of the abominations of the earth. Different language, same concept. Then the cover of lead was raised and there in the basket sat a woman. He said, this is wickedness. And he pushed her back into the basket and pushed its lead cover down on it. Okay, I want to just pause there for a minute because I want to cross-reference something that I think is important. So first, I want to point out to you that this is a basket. It has a church in it. It contains the iniquity of the people throughout the land. Now it's being described as wickedness and she's pushed back into the basket and he pushes the lead cover down on it. Now look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. Listen to what he says. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will all believe, they will believe the lie. Same concept, slightly different language. He said, this is wickedness. And he's not talking about pagans, is he? He's talking about those who think that they're in him. Those who are counterfeit, who are swearing falsely in his name. And there's a curse that he is sending them to destroy them. Then I looked up and there before me were two women. With the wind in their wings, they had wings like those of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. Where are they taking the basket? I asked the angel who was speaking to me. He replied to the country of Babylonia to build a house for it. When the house is ready, the basket will be set there in its place. What, what is that house? It is the kingdom of counterfeit Christianity. It is the kingdom of the harlot, Babylon the Great, and the prostitutes that bore out of her. All who love and practice falsehood. Those of whom God is going to turn to them and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things in your name? Aren't we part of you essentially? And he's going to say, depart from me, evildoers. I never knew you. What does he say in Hosea 4, 6? My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also reject you as my priests because you have ignored the law of the Lord, your God, uh, of your God. I will also ignore your children. What a terrible thing to do to your children. And then there's second Thessalonians 2, 9. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie in all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. They are delusional. Guys, I was a psychologist in the world. I've been around a lot of delusional people. There is nothing like counterfeit Christianity, let me tell you. To take the context of scripture and turn it into what they've turned it into, and to think that they're going to be saved doing the things that they're doing right now, which are blatantly wrong, to pagans. Pagans are shocked at the lewd conduct of those who claim to be serving God. 
There is no delusion like counterfeit Christianity, like what is going on, particularly here in the United States of America, which are supposed to be, you know, really intelligent, civilized people. <laughs> okay, not so much, guys. Other nations who don't even have the word of God, they don't even know the word of God. Look at the conduct of those claiming to be God's chosen people, and they're disgusted. All right, we're moving on to Zechariah 6. But again, I want you to remember that God is continuing his stream of thought. It's not just because we're going on to 6 and there's a new heading and there's a new chapter does not mean that this is going to change things. Now, there are some contexts of scripture, like Revelation is really known for this, okay? Revelation jumps around quite a bit. Revelation introduced the, introduces the witnesses in the 144,000 in Revelation 7. Then it talks about them in Revelation 11. Talks about them in Revelation 6 when talking about the seals and those under the altar who have been slain. So it talks about them as being, they're, they're no, no longer, I mean, at least here on earth, they've been killed. That's the first mention. Well, technically, the first mention is in Revelation 2 and 3 when he's talking to the two lampstands who have pleased him, who, whom he's not rebuking. So he's, okay, so let's start there. Revelation 2 and 3, he's talking to them and he's, you know, saying, okay, you've done what you're supposed to do. I'm going to spare you from the hour of trial that I'm going to bring on the entire earth to test the inhabitants of the earth. I know your poverty. I know that you have little strength, yet you've continued to endure. So he's saying all these things to him. Then in Revelation 6, you see him and they're dead. In the physical, they're dead. Obviously, they live on. They're under the under the altar and they're saying how long sovereign lord holy and true until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood and they're given a white white robes and they're told wait a little longer until the full number of your brothers and sisters have been killed just as you have been by the way the implication is every, all brothers and sisters everyone going up in that first resurrection is going to be killed just the same as the witnesses have been and then the next time you see the witnesses show up is in revelation 7 when they're being sealed before the um first four trumpets blow. Why the first four? Because they're going to die at the fifth. And then in Revelation 11, God is describing these witnesses as being prophets and um, talking about how they're going to die. Well, wait a minute. In Revelation 6, we saw that they were already dead. So Revelation is not going in order. It's kind of bouncing around, but it's still talking about this time period. And then Revelation 9, you see that that fifth trumpet has blown. Satan has lost his place in the heavenly realms. And this is describing that process that was actually described in Revelation 11, where the, the beast is actually going to rise from the abyss, overpower and kill the witnesses. Now you see that happening in Revelation 9. And in Revelation 12, it's talking about the witnesses as well, that they did not love their lives so much as to shrink, shrink from death, and that they bore their testimony for 1260 days. And this is the second requirement in order to triumph over the devil. And so you know why the devil is rising from the abyss in order to overpower and kill the witnesses, because he's angry. He's angry because he knows his time is short. He knows that those two requirements in God's law have been fulfilled. He was not able to throw the witnesses off course by all of his, the tormenting that he does. And I can tell you right now, he, he does. He does what he can. He stands before God day and night accusing the brethren. So what do you think he does? What do you think he does with God regarding the witnesses? Well, they did this. Well, they, you know, haven't reconciled this. So God is constantly working with the witnesses to clean us up and to minister so that we are, so, so we're purified, made spotless and refined. We haven't been chosen because we arrived. We've been chosen because of what God is doing. So when I tell you that I'm a witness, I'm not telling you that I have some sort of status. I'm the scum of the earth here. I'm not telling you that I've arrived. I'm treated more severely in terms of judgment because of the role, because of the responsibility that I have. So point being that in Revelation, God is, is bouncing around a bit, but you also have to understand that he's not going to dole this out to people who by their carnality are studying scripture. He's going to give this to you as you rend your heart to him, as you pursue his heart, because as you're understanding scripture and biblical prophecy, that's part of what God is doing in your covenant is cleaning you up and giving you a heart to know him and to love him and to pursue his truth. If you don't do that, you will never know him. You will never understand his word. You will never be able to teach it and you will not fulfill your covenant because love for God fulfills everything. And if you can't love God, if you're going to treat him like some puzzle and you don't connect with him, 
you can't fulfill your covenant. There's no way to fulfill your covenant. So those of you struggling with that, you need to be doing, you need to be doing the work. And if you don't know the work that you need to be doing, then get the books that I offer to you for free on the channel. Because if you're not connected to yourself, you can't possibly have a relationship with anyone else. And you need to know how to do what God has said to do, rather than just treating it like a series of check marks. All right, let's go to Zechariah 6. Continuous thought. I looked up again, and there before me were four chariots coming out from between the mountains, the two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black, the third white, the fourth dappled, all of them powerful. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these, my Lord? The angel answered me, these are the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. The one with the black horse horses is going toward the north country. Now in Revelation 6, it's just talking about a horse. Here, it's talking about chariots, but it's the same thing. Different language, same concept. In Revelation 6, it talks about a dappled horse, or excuse me, a pale horse. Here, it's talking about a dappled horse. Dappled is just spotted, and pale is just pale. You can have both a pale and a dappled horse. Don't let that freak you out. The one with the black horses is going toward the north country. The one with the white horse horses toward the west. The one with the dappled horses toward the south. When the powerful horses went out, they were straining to go throughout the earth. And he said, go throughout the earth. So they went throughout the earth. Now, these horses are different from, I know we didn't read it together, but if you're familiar with Zechariah, and you should, regardless of whether you're familiar with it, you should be going back and reading it. In chapter 1, there are some horses that are mentioned, and those horses are going back, they're going throughout the earth, and then they're reporting to him. And they're reporting to him that everyone feels secure. You know, peace, peace, they say when there's no peace. And God is angry with the nations that feel secure. Here, God is bringing judgment. They're doing something here. You see that they're straining to go throughout the earth, and he says, go throughout the earth, and they go. Then he called to me, look, those going toward the north country have given my spirit rest in the land of the north. Okay, now that's kind of a weird way to say that. Um, there are different translations. I think the best translation for this is the NASB. Then he called out to me and spoke to me saying, see, those who are going to the land of the north have appeased my wrath in the land of the north. Okay, so if you are frustrated because, you know, you like your children, I mean, you know, we're, we're God's children, right? We're described as his children. So your children have been naughty. They've completely disobeyed. You gave them a, some sort of a punishment, but you go into the room and they're, they're playing. Maybe even fighting, you know, pulling each other's hair out. Are you going to feel a certain, you feel a certain amount of angst, okay? This is our design. That when there's injustice, and that's a form of injustice, like this, something is not right here, the measure is not right, so you feel something stir up inside of you, like an angst. And until things are set right, you don't, you continue to feel that angst because that's a normal, that, that's our design. That's what God has done in order to help us to understand what needs to happen. Well, we've been made in God's image. We've been designed after him. And so what is happening here is that God feels a certain amount of angst over what it is that we've been doing. He's upset that we are not taking him seriously. That we think, oh, everything's okay. We, we all feel secure, even though we live according to the nations, even though we live as pagans. No, no, no. He is not having that. And so until that's rectified, he's going to feel a certain amount of angst. And that is what's being demonstrated here. And so you hear, it, when you read the NA, NASB version of this particular um, Zechariah 6, 8, this particular verse, this fits and, and describes that a little better than just giving his spirit rest. But uh, what I want you to understand is in saying, uh, given his spirit rest, it's that, okay, now this has been resolved. Then he called out to me and spoke to me saying, see those who are going to the land of the north have appeased my wrath in the land of the north. Now this has been rectified. The word of the Lord came to me, take silver and gold from the exiles, Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah who have arrived from Babylon. Now, I want, to, I want to tell you something. When the word says, the word of the Lord came to me, it is going to shift gears. And you can kind of expect that there's going to be something that God is going to say that might seem like, oh, this feels disjointed or this feels fragmented. It doesn't feel like a continuous stream of thought. Hang with it. You need to sit with it and understand, okay, 
What have I read thus far? This is a continuous stream of thought. How does this have to do with what I've read thus far? The word of the Lord came to me, take silver and gold from the exiles of Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon. Go the same day to the house of Josiah, son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest, Joshua, son of Josadak. Tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from this place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord. And he will be clothed with, clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne. And he will be a priest on his throne. And there will be harmony between the two. Obviously, we're, we're talking about a representation of Jesus. And there will be harmony between the two. The crown will be given to Heldai, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hen, son of Zephaniah, as a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Those who are far away will come and help build the temple of the Lord. And you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. This will happen. Listen to this sentence. This will happen if contingency, contingency, okay? So you have to remember anytime you see if that we're talking about your covenant, we're talking about the contract that you have with God. God doesn't need a contract. No one needs a contract if he's just handing something over to you. So if God's talking about a covenant, then you know that there is something that he's going to do if you do what you're going to do. If you fulfill the terms of the contract, this will happen if you diligently obey the Lord your God. Okay, so what did I say? I said, we're going to look at what has he been talking about because God is not disjointed. He's not disorganized. This is a continuous stream of thought. He's been talking about Zechariah 4, talks about the witnesses and the fact that he's building this temple. He's completing the temple that he's laid the foundation for. Now he's continuing and he's saying, you know, that, that people are going to rejoice when they see the chosen capstone. Many are called, few are chosen. The chosen capstone in the hands of Zerubbabel. Then he talks about a curse that's going out. And this curse is going to separate the wheat from the tares. All those who are thieves, all those who swear falsely in his name, that curse is going to go into them and it's going to destroy them spiritually. Then he talks about a house that's being built in Babylon and that that basket that contains the woman, the church that is for whom a house is being built represents wickedness, the iniquity of the people. We cross-reference that with falsehood, rejecting truth, rejecting knowledge. So God rejects them as his priests and it's being set in Babylonia when the house is completed. Okay, so he has separated the wheat from the tares and now the tares are going to their house. In Zechariah 1, he had sent those horses out to go see what was going on, to go scope out what's going on over there. And he found the world at rest and at peace. But God was upset. And he said, now they've taken the punishment too far. I'm angry with the nations that feel secure. So now he's sending out judgment. Now he's sending out this wrath because they're not taking him seriously at all. Now, what's going on with his people? His people, we're told in Ezekiel, are grieving and lamenting the detestable things that are going on in, this, in, in Jerusalem, in God's church. So they're very disgusted and upset about this. Do I say I'm disgusted and upset ever about the things that I'm talking to you about? They're disgusted. They're upset. They're grieving and lamenting the detestable things that are being done in Jerusalem, in God's people. And so this is a message for them. The branch is going to spread out. He's going to build this temple. And those who are far away are going to come and help build the temple of the Lord if they diligently obey the Lord their God. I'm going to tell you right now, the bar is high, guys. God does not tolerate people coming around and bringing their drama and their nonsense. He's going to hold you accountable. And if you respond to that, if you're willing to hold yourself accountable and you're willing to diligently obey the Lord your God, you're willing to be cleaned up, you're willing to take the, to accept and consider the rebuke of God's servants whom he has sent to help clean you up, you will be involved in building the house of God. Can you imagine any greater honor? It's a pretty big deal. All right, we've gotten pretty far on the video, and uh, it's so it's a little bit long. I'm going to separate this into part one and part two. And so in part two, I'm going to read um, from, we're on Zechariah 6. I'm going to read Zechariah 7 and 8. And then we're going to discuss a little bit about fruit that you need to be, um, that you need to be uh, producing.
if in fact you're going to make it. Please discern this message with God.